seems like the behavior is complete fucking crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> now this is like fucking first first day of first grade. First day of first grade. That's where we're at. I can take that. Okay, and that will be the topic today. <laughs> How to not fuck with people. Um, pay ask for me your, anything. Your information. Ask me anything. Ask me a question. Ask me anything. Hey, right. oh, that's good. That. If you're gonna do it, you gotta do it. She's like, um, um, I need to be invited. I'm a vampire. She's a vampire dog. So no. <clears throat> now that we've got All that right. out of the way, the actual topic is pasteurization. Pasties. As I like to call them. Pasteurization. <laughs> and sterilization. Sterilize me. <laughs> wow. Right. This house makes fun of this. With steam. <laughs> With steam. Um, I like how you're drawn on this one. This is excellent. Well, I'll do the writing. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'll do the illustrations. Yeah, well, yeah. And the breeds heavily on your judges. But well, wait. But wait. There's more. And what <laughs> this means is that most people use steam to kill off contaminants in their blocks, in their grain, whatever the case might be, in their liquids. There are alternatives. We know people who are doing them. Uh, dry, there's convection uh, heat that can be used. That's the really uh, more. There's also shady stuff like formaldehyde. Shady stuff. Um, or tindalization and all these weird uh, old school, uncommon, or not recommended options. Um, but we're mostly going to focus on steam the uh yeah the x's and o's of running a good pasteurization uh cycle um and what that entails as far as how you got to handle your blocks and risk and yada yada and then we'll also look in sterilization contrast the two talk about empirically what defines these things and how you got to go about running your production based off of the choice you make the choice Actually, we had a good conversation about, or I did with somebody about this yesterday, considering steam. And the funny part about the sterilization pasteurization side is how you actually generate steam. And I feel like maybe that's a good place to start. Where does the steam come from? Yeah. Because there's like different types of efficiencies for these things, right? So if we're considering an electric bubba barrel you're essentially filling this barrel with a little bit of water and it's got a heating element and that heating element is just you know hooked up to like a 240 plug right so you're packing as many sub blocks in here as possible covering it with a lid and letting some steam weep out that is as efficiently inefficient as it gets in terms of timeline, right? So this magical bubble barrel, which produces steam via electric, is like a, what? It takes like fucking 12 to 18 hours. I've heard of seeing amounts of time from people. Or more. Yeah. Um. But technically, you're pasteurizing it. Yeah, for sure. And by definition, oh, I didn't put my phone on airplane mode. What a dick. So, Bubba Barrels, electric, steam takes for fucking ever, right? Right. But then, but then, you can have a container, a vessel, if you will. Would you like to write the word vessel in there? Yeah. And all over here, I'll write the word boiler. So vessel, a vessel can be anything that is essentially non-porous. <laughs> Although we've made wooden steam boxes. And uh, 
all you're trying to do is get these up to pasteurization temperatures. So instead of using an electric heating element to get a small minute layer of water to boil, you're essentially using a boiler or a steam generator cha -cha -cha, to feed the vessel with steam and replace that air that's in the vessel with steam by exhausting the air out. How boring is that? I think it's important. It's an important rationalization um, of these two things. There's a slight, like, in, in the world of boilers, there is, like, if I'm correct, there are slight, like, differentiations about what qualifies as a steam generator versus what actually fits the bill as a real boiler. And That's then, of course, true. there's a step up from that, which is high-pressure boilers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, no, and as pertaining to all of that stuff, we'll go into it more. The only difference between uh, a steam generator and a boiler in regards to the vessel you're using is what if this is a pressure vessel? Yeah. And this is really just the third option in this whole shenanigans. Right. You either have uh, a small electric steam generator, like in the case of a bubble barrel, a vessel that's just empty and being fed with a boiler or a steam generator that generates a fairly high volume of steam until the internals of this get up or you have a really oversized boiler and uh and essentially that allows you to build pressure in your vessel to you know force the air out and inject it and fill it with steam right and if you're pasteurizing then with this outlet as depicted here you're never under pressure no matter like that's under if you pressure. are under pressure then you're starting to creep up towards a sterilization protocol right um with and this, you might be pumping in an obscene rate of, of steam, but as long as it's not hermetically sealed and it's constantly venting out, then you're never going to get beyond uh, 212. Yeah, that's true. And uh, being the boiling point. Yeah. I guess we should we should just talk about the function of these things independently before we talk about the issues surrounding them. So sure. Sense. All right. So like in order of importance. Dude, I really like your cursive, I feel like, but you should put Thank it you. up there. Yeah, yeah, up there. You can get rid of this. Yeah, fucking swipe it out. All right, what am I? Do you, want to, you can just write steam. No, no, oh. should, should it be steam? I feel like I'm, I don't know. Yeah. So we're talking about- How to generate steam. Nice. <laughs> I have a serious addiction. It's bad. It's not coffee. Are you drinking coffee these days? Yeah. I just, I told you, I drink like way too much at like 5 a.m. So, right. I think I'm like, time do you get up? I don't know. Maybe like two hours ahead Maybe of you in the. Yeah, you must be in the wave. All right, I'm on my way down then. This makes sense. All right, so how to generate steam without talking about coffee too hard? Um, like we just said, we have basically three different ways. So you have an electric option and an electric option is essentially like what's in the bottom of your hot water heater, you know? So you have a heating element that basically sits at the base of whatever submerged under a thin layer of contained uh, aqua or H2O. <laughs> and you have your vessel and essentially... <laughs> <laughs> so Come essentially on. what you're trying to do is you're trying to heat this water up and you're heating it to the point at which it gets to boiling point which you know at sea level is 212 fahrenheit and that forms steam as steam goes up it's basically water goes down steam goes up and uh and everything above that water mark becomes pasteurized eventually but it takes a really long time because that heating element's only so strong and, yeah i mean uh, a lot of the waiting is just getting that up to temp yeah with these it's it's crazy which is people have used uh, all americans they know what we're talking about bubble yeah. barrels yeah all that stuff um yeah yeah it's crazy when you think about like uh I, i've definitely heard people say this is like a 24-hour thing and and then sometimes they'll hold it for more or whatever yeah. but uh yeah 
The alternative to this, which is an interesting, everybody's like, okay, this is pasteurization. You're getting it up to 212 and you're, you're basically getting your internal bags above 200 Fahrenheit. So once your bags are at that point, you can hold it for, you know, one to three hours, let's say. Right. Um, you can hold it for more, but it presents issues. <clears throat> so this is the cheapest way by far, which I don't actually know anymore. I think bubble barrels are getting quite fucking expensive. They definitely are because they become trendy. Yeah, um, they are trendy. And obviously they're viable, but um, yeah. Yeah. there's some kind of characteristic issues uh, that it seems like people run into. Um, I don't know if we should get into this now, but <laughs> no. when it comes to like yeah, how you load anymore. and volume and all that, we can probably have that as a separate topic. But. Well, let's explain that after we explain the next alternative, which is what a lot of people are going right. towards right now, which is, um, I don't know how much people are in the know of these different weird instruments, but they kind of look like strange submarine doors and they are, you know, pressure vesseled. And what they essentially are fermentation tanks for breweries and there's a company called uh, Blue Myco, I think. It's oh, uh, yeah, right. So a fair amount of people are buying these. And uh, <clears throat> there's a couple other people who are making like 55-gallon uh, drum pressure vessels. I mean, I just like don't advise these things. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem <laughs> but, yeah. fit for that. It seems crazy. Level of pressure, yeah. This one's a little bit more expensive, but once again, it's a heating element. And the only reason it is actually as function as higher, highly functioning as like a uh, um, pressure cooker and a, and a bubble barrel is it's somewhere in between. And essentially, it's because it can build up pressure. So you're trying to build up pressure with steam. It takes a long time still to generate this, you know, because there's no existing boiler for these. So blue this lighters. isn't much faster, a little bit faster than a bubble, or really not no. at all. No, I think it's about the same probably. Okay. It's probably about a day production, like 24 hour cycle would be my assumption because these go from like, I think it's like 10 to 30 liters or something like that. Like they're pretty large. So you might be able to fit like a hundred bags in them. So if you're trying to do grain spawn, you know, this is an option at the lowest possible, most affordable level. If you're trying to do substrate, I wouldn't advise going in this direction because there's no real need to get, you know, 15 PSI <laughs> yeah. for substrate at all, especially at this size scale. But once again, this is an electric heating element. So, right, right. oh, you already wrote it. Yep. Do you see the body electric? Who wrote that? It wasn't Lana Del Rey. I'll give you that. I sing the body electric. Yeah. That was fucking, um, uh, what's his name? The Walt Whitney. Battle, the... Starship Troopers, Robert Heinlein, right? No, it was Walt Whitman, but that's cool. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yes, I... <laughs> Starship Troopers. <laughs> that's fucking awesome. All right, so you got Blue Mico and you got a Bubba Barrel. There, I mean, like, I can't think of any other real options that are out there. Those two as things are... As far as electric. Are, uh, yeah, as eating electric. elements are concerned. Yeah, yes. and then... there's one other option. Should we talk about the other option, the unicorn option? Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. We might as well. We might as well say something. Basically, Unicorn Lou, like him, hate him, love him, has created, <laughs> he hasn't created, he's just buying in uh, single or double door autoclaves, which are electric, uh, which are basically electric uh, elements. And these electric elements are, you know, I think they're like 240. They have to be like, uh, fuck, 60 amps maybe. Good God. <laughs> it's so much electricity for like this little layer of water to actually get this thing, which is pretty big, up to 15 PSI. What? I'm just going to oust them because it's kind of interesting, but Norse Borer has used these for years. That's part of the rationale and why we didn't go down like a traditional autoclave route. So what are bubble barrels? Bubble barrels are like almost a thousand dollars, a couple thousand dollars. I, I think it really depends now because they're like such a hot item that like yeah. depending on your sizing and your little like yeah. your options basically. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. <clears throat> well, blue mica thing is probably like between seven to 10, something like that. 
And then one of these is like, I think these are like 35 grand, something like wow. that. So you have this like, you know, gradient of 10 to 35 K, let's say. So that's, this is this weird investment for uh, pasteurization of blocks from the Bubba Barrel standpoint to sterilization of some sort of grain to the mico, or blue mica to this, which mm-hmm. is, you know, you can do substrate, you can do, um, you can do spawn. You just have to consider like, as with any like big purchase like this, you know, you have your upfront consideration yeah, of right, the cost and right. then you have operating costs and then you have time. Jesus. And um, maintenance. And Cause these those fuckers, over the long run. Yeah. Yeah. Those heating elements out from what I understand, cause we know a couple people who use these units is they have to be replaced quite often or uh, adapted or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think this is like a 10 foot autoclave. So it's also, it's not like enormous for the time it takes to actually generate this. It's once again, it's probably like an 18 hour cycle or more. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and let's clarify 15 PSI because it actually doesn't get up to 15 PSI because that would be illegal, I guess. So it's like, it hovers at around uh, between 12 and 14. Okay. Um, that's like an, that's an important distinction, right? But, you right. Know, For sure. We can go into that a little later, but the, uh, the main sort of barrier for entry in pasteurization to, uh, sterilization in an electrical format are these three options. So you can call good old unicorn Lou up and, uh, he'll be eager if you talk to him about these. Yeah, man. Did I do as good as you? Shit. Yours is better. Can actually read yours. Mine just looks like I yeah, it's not, it's not bad. right. Can't tell if it's an F though. Uh, that's Unicorn. true. Uh, it could be a foo. Whatever you can call him if you want to. Lou's not a bad dude. Um. Anyways, those are the three electrical options. Sixty amps is a lot of amps, dude. It's crazy. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So you're running that for fucking that long, like just to produce steam and pressure it's not an efficient run. And like, we can get into that in detail in a minute, but like, uh, your utilities yeah. can go from being like, we're used to thinking of these things as like marginal changes over time, depending right. on their decisions. But right. the more you start making, the more your utilities become just a gigantic <laughs> operating cost that you can't just be cavalier about. No, you really have to compare like, the yeah processing time and the um and the quality so right the quality is going to uh i can't like write and talk today it's really funny yeah what you're trying to say here is uh (laughs) the more to ride his way but i don't have sunglasses (laughs) yeah um the amount of the more time that's spent uh exposing your growing medium to steam the lower the quality of the growing medium will be you want to find that optimal middle ground where if you're pasteurizing it's thoroughly pasteurized aka you know at um you know internal temps around 200 up to 212 um for one to three hours your blocks are completely rid of um all molds and fungi um any active bacteria and then the only thing remaining are the endospores of bacteria um sure hopefully you can overcook it mildly yeah you, uh, you know you can overcook it and it might be sure like you have this greater sense of comfort which is totally unnecessary <laughs> yeah that you've killed everything off but you've also basically just roasted your blocks to the point where your uh your spawn your mycelium isn't going to be as happy growing in that environment because it's literally chemically altered through steam so yeah uh, that's totally true yeah i mean we, we run into all these issues uh, uh especially like consulting with other farms and places primarily because they're asking like us what is the proper investment what should i like what should i do you know so I'm not going to say no to any of those three options really because depends. if they're your fuck, if that's what you can afford, that's what you can afford. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Who um, knows? Maybe you're like in a spot where you have like, you rented a part of a warehouse and you got insane amperage on hand. Yeah. 
And also sausage. electricity, like if you're trying to fire some of the oil right now, right. you might as well use electricity. Right. And maybe you, you only want to do like one run a day in the fact that, or yeah. one run a week rather, in the fact that, um, you know, it takes 24 hours is, is justifiable for you. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to write propane. Ah, let's just write gas. Right. Gas, bitches. Um, we have like a lot of uh, uh, things that we can use to uh, back up this sort of lingo, especially with our own infrastructure. So we'll throw a lot of videos into this to explain it. But right. um, when I say gas, I just mean not electric. So right. So it could be natural propane. gas or propane. And yeah. It's worth mentioning that a lot of, not all, and you can speak to this better than I can, but a lot of equipment you can convert to. Like oh, we yeah. We had to do that with one of our steam kettles. It was initially set up for natural gas, and it's just a matter of swapping out a bunch of fittings for um, yeah. having it tied into propane. Yeah, it's essentially ports and uh, and some other different components to make sure it doesn't... Propane just burns so fucking clean, whereas natural mm -hmm. gas, I think, burns cleaner or not as clean, but the port size has to be different because it's all about... Uh, you know, suck, bang, blow. So you're trying to pull air in, make an explosion, and exhaust that shit. Anybody who rides the motorcycle should know this. Come we were now. just talking about going through TSA. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. It's a whole nother Anywho, uh, <laughs> Don't gas, gas meaning <laughs> natural gas, propane. Yeah. Yeah, Hell, propane. even like an oil-fired fucking boiler, I guess. Yeah. That was propane. Natural gas, I guess oil. I mean, there, there's definitely there's oil probably somebody there. doing that. Yeah, yeah. And granted, that shit's really expensive. But anyways, not electric. Small electric, mostly run blowers. Um, yeah, very limited amperage. Yeah. So to give a metric, uh, because uh, this is like Eric Milligan's fault too for starting the whole Sioux obsession. I don't know anybody who used anything uh, Sioux besides him. Uh, 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, Eric, maybe more, bought a, Sioux is a, it's a company out of, where is it? Fucking South Dakota or North Dakota? There's somewhere in the Dakotas. Man, you just offended a whole fucking tribe. Did I really? Is it, is it IU? <laughs> dude, I'm just white. I'm a white guy. Fuck, dude. All right, you spell it. That's sex corp right there. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> I never graduated. Right? Yeah, that's uh, cool. Yeah, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Sex corp. the whole fucking trap. Slow down. Jesus. All right, all right. I'll right. <laughs> take my time. Uh, <laughs> Sue Corp creates uh, steam generators. I can spell steam. <laughs> and essentially, these are like low-pressure uh, boilers. So you don't need a license to operate them. They're right. all under 15 PSI right. boilers. And that's the key where... Yeah. yeah, licenses and regulations and all that can get, to, it really depends on the state, but yeah. you have to do your due diligence legally. Yeah, to um, make sure that you're not... If you're trying to operate at 15 PSI or, or higher. Yeah, for sure. And I think they have, I forget what the, the uh, names are, but I think it's SR11 and the SR25. Yeah, that sounds right. Essentially, it's like quarter of a million BTUs. And I think this is a half a million uh, BTUs. Uh, yeah, so the difference between these is not negligible for sure. Uh, uh, it's how often it comes on uh, based in the, um, the volume of the actual unit, which I think the SR11 is a little bit smaller. So when we're talking about boilers, we're talking about like two main issues. The first issue is um, uh, BTUs and horsepower. So horsepower uh, versus and BTUs, right? And then volume. So the more volume of steam you have, the more you're pumping that steam into an actual vessel, whether it's an autoclave, whether it's a steam box, a shipping container, you name it. You have to make sure that the volume of that is able to keep up with whatever you're trying to use. So <clears throat> I know a couple of people with the SR11s and they can steam uh, pasteurize, uh, let's say a 20 foot shipping container at the most. But I think most SR11s, uh, the people are using these SR11s are 
operating with like 10 foot shipping containers. Mm -hmm. And those 10 foot shipping containers can do something like 500 blocks in a run, right? Right. So, and that's at like what you would consider like a good baseline timeline yeah. of, uh, you know, yeah, give or take and uh, eight, eight hours, 10 hours, somewhere in that range. Yeah, so you have this 10 foot shipping container, which are great for pasteurization chambers. Just don't fucking make a steam box for fuck's sake. And then you have your SR11. Man, if I'm fucking this up, I'm sorry. I think it's SR. It's something 11. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but essentially, you know, it becomes this like really easy transfer of steam because this has enough capacity to fill this with steam and inject it, you know, and then exhaust it. Um, so that pass through is really important. We'll go into that after, but just trying to nail down these like, you know, boiler options. Yeah. And that's basically <laughs> the principle is it has to be right sized for, yeah. um, it's application, AKA the, the volume of blocks and the volume of the container that yeah you are working with. Yeah. The SR25, which is half a million BTUs or more, um, it's, uh, you can do a 20 or 40 foot shipping container capacity wise. So you're going from 500 blocks to, uh, you know, a thousand plus, um, and that thousand plus blocks is really, you know, sort of the, I'm not going to say like capacity, but it's like, it's the capacity for a, a pasteurization container, yeah. given that you're using a low pressure boiler. Um, these are all low pressure boilers from Sue. So, uh, they're good options, man. And they're like, well, I forget who bought that for like 30 to 40 K, which is actually, it could be cheaper than that. I think it was like 18 or yeah. But who knows now? Yeah, so yeah, who yeah. Knows? I think it was 18 to 20, but now it's probably 30 to 40. So it seems like a huge investment, but you go from being able to do in uh, even a loose style autoclave a couple hundred at most, you know, over a whole day to a thousand. So, are you going to spend this thirty to forty k on a single autoclave that takes forever to use, or do you just buy a fucking five thousand dollars shipping container and a eighteen to forty k boiler and call it a day? This is like an eight to ten hour run. <clears throat> So you can go home at night up. is the idea. Like, yeah. <laughs> Nobody's coming in at 4 yeah. a.m. Tweaking. Board. Probably worth mentioning on the front end, and we can reiterate this a hundred times over, and most people know about this for most of their plumbing, but uh, <laughs> water softening um, oh, becomes can be essential, right? quite right. key to not fuck up such an important and expensive piece of equipment. Yeah, should we talk about boilers for a minute? Sure. Before you go on to the pressure. So that's pasteurization. Uh, if you're you're in a shipping container or you want to weld the fucking box together, yeah. just buy a shipping container for fuck's sake. Well, you know what? Before we go on, I think we should, um, uh, aside from the you know mechanics of it and the equipment, just talk about like why you might want to go in that direction, why you might want to go in the other direction. In terms and, of electric versus... Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, pasteurization versus sterilization. Oh, totally. I was just covering pasteurization for now uh, just to like... Are we can. Should we do that? Should we comb? No, I, I sort of comb. mean just like... A, uh, what are the difference between the two? Totally. Yeah, just super totally. basic stuff. So, All right, yeah, so we're going to we're gonna put a little tag in boiler maintenance. <laughs> All right, before we forget, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so 30,000 foot view thing here. Um, we already mentioned pasteurization. Like the standard that we recommend is one to three uh, hours where the internal temp of your growing medium is between 200 and 212. So that's like the gold standard of no matter what else is going on with your cycle and your equipment and how long it takes, this is the variable that really matters. Um, and that is internal temperature, not, not the ambient temp. The ambient temp in the chamber or whatever is gonna reach this pretty darn quick. Yeah. Really um, to get into a dense 10 pound block or whatever, it's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, and the idea of pasteurization is that number one, you don't use pressure. So it simplifies things as far as risk, literal risk and, uh, legality. Um, yeah. and, uh, you end up killing off basically most of the microbiota that typically cause problems for cultivation. So it successfully should kill off all fungi. Fungi can survive above 160 in most cases, Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, most of these are dying at like 110. And even most bacteria are too. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in pasteurization to any active by, uh, bacteria that have, you know, propagated, um, they will die as well. Um, it's the endospores that bacteria form that will survive this process. Yeah. The thermophilic variety, uh, species of bacteria that they have these endospores that are basically this hard cell wall that will survive almost anything you throw at them. Um, it's got like a magnetic field of chaos around mm -hmm. it. Right. <laughs> it kind of looks like COVID. It's an no. extremophile, as they call them. It um, is. It's and extreme. so pasteurizations, uh, like long story short, it's like generally cheaper, a little bit more straightforward. And then another key aspect to consider is um, <clears throat> the different uh, kind of handling and facility uh, considerations after that point. So when you're pasteurizing, you can get away with a lot. Uh, you have a much bigger margin for error in terms of like how clean is the space, how clean are the people inoculating those blocks and so forth, you know? Like you can successfully move a pasteurized, you know, rack of blocks through, through a, a space, space that's not some like beautiful, pristine, overpressured lab um, and really be completely fine. Yeah, I'm gonna show a video of this right now. But basically, <laughs> right now, <laughs> ah, shit. Um, um, but yeah, basically the 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 lab, which should be overpressurized, should be pretty close in proximity and not go outside per se. Although some farms do it, Neil. And uh, I think that it's not a bad thing to like examine is the fact that when you're pulling your blocks out red hot. And bringing them through a dirty area, as John Donahue put it, fucking ten years ago to me, everything's touching the block is just dying on impact, <laughs> to a degree. Right. You definitely pull blocks across dirty areas where neurospora has been like growing outside. Yeah, it's and then there's like everything. yeah, neurospora is <laughs> like a, a mean one for sure. Yeah, um, but the goal of this like pasteurization is basically to, you know, everything is red, red hot coming out of your uh, sterilizer or your, I should say, your pasteurization container. Um, your vessel. Yeah, your past vessel. Past vest, bud. That sounds like a venereal <laughs> disease of some kind. And this area shouldn't have a lot of airflow. So low airflow. Um, clean. And clean. Disinfect it, mop it, you know. Yeah, this area basic. It can be outside, but you know, if this is a leaky ass yeah. fucking vessel of some kind, and you're trying to like bring it into your overpressurized sterile laboratory, HEPA, 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 HEPA lab, um, you're gonna end up with uh, um, blocks that come in here really hot and cool down under HEPA filtration and have, you know, basically a 99% success rate. Right. Please refer to, that. what was that, episode two, right? Um, oh, shit. Yeah, for that, yeah, for that whole then. thing, which we'll get into again in a future date, but like they have to go hand in hand. Did, did. Another thing, you know, people are always going to want to like, uh, like you're going to once in a while, you're going to drop a block. You're going to drop a rack. Oh, yeah. even Yeah. Don't pick it up. <laughs> don't, 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 don't put it in with everything else that you didn't drop. <laughs> yeah. You very likely could risk everything you made. Yeah, for sure. Because um, the thing is, is like, you know, even if you're cleaning this, guarantee there's a bunch of particulates and organic matter and mold on the floor. Um, that can still and just by rubbing it all over your block then putting it in this environment you might fuck everything up so Save just don't it for your do soap it. making the, right? the, the uh yeah make the, your, uh, make your uh, waste millet it's hard soap. to do that it's hard to say goodbye block right later dude. we've all been there but just, just throw take the, the loss away. and move on yeah it's true um so i mean that is a huge advantage to pasteurization and that's something worth mentioning is, yeah yeah you you have this moment but I would not cool down, unlike some people do, inside right. of a pasteurization vessel. Explain why, as I shut this motor Right, out. right. So a few factors here. So it's um, with pasteurization, you do have a, a basically an expiration date after which the, bl the blocks start to ferment and they're not going to be suitable for inoculation. So you got to inoculate them straight away. Um, and they are just more susceptible at that point to uh, contamination the more they cool down. So you want them cooled down in a uh, HEPA filtered, incredibly clean environment. So because once they get down to, you know, depending on the type of contaminants, somewhere in the hundred something degree range, um, they become liable to contamination. And so if they're in this space surrounded by a bunch of fucking 
puddles of water and dirt and warehouse and metal and yada yada. And then you bring them across the semi clean area? Yeah, then the chances are they got contaminated overnight basically. Um, And then you're bringing those into your lab and that only compounds the issue. Yeah, so um, don't be a bitch and put some fucking welding gloves on and bring those just, sons of bitches yeah. out hot. And then, uh, and then let them cool down in here, and you're good. Sorry, I didn't mean to call everybody a bitch. And yeah, not to go circle back to the the HEPA thing too deep, but just to reinstate it one last time because I've talked to farms a bunch of times that make this mistake. These are not recirculating HEPA filters inside the lab. Otherwise, it's not providing that function that you're after if they're fed from the outside as an overpressure unit. Right. Let's just draft that up real fast, right? Right. So, I mean, this it's similar similar for how these things are going to function pasteurization-wise, but uh, um, yeah, your, your filters, let's pick a wall. They're basically, the fans are outside of your wall right here. And the filter, the filter's on the inside of the wall and it's connected to this fan. So that filter is essentially feeding, it's being fed from dirty air and then it goes across a filter inside of the room. That's the filter. Yeah. Basically only clean air comes through. And what that's doing when it's pulling air from outside is it's positive pressurizing the space. Because that is the one input through which air gets in, otherwise it's hermetically sealed. And it's gonna take the path of least resistance. So ideally up high in a corner, and then let's say, you know, this is the the back corners over here. You want an exit to go that way, you know? And then you got nice smooth airflow, clean airflow, and more pressure in here, always pushing air away, basically. Exactly. You're just creating a straight up. Yep. And that looks like it's epic. Yeah, the idea. Episode, episode two. two. Episode two. <laughs> but those things have to go hand in hand. They do. And pasteurization works in a similar manner. So briefly to go into it, because I think it's important before we dip into sterilization, because it, it's a bit different. Um, let's draw the same thing. You have your 10 or 20 foot shipping container, right? And essentially, oh, yeah. A lot of people will consider this the wrong way to do it. And let me describe why. Um, And they're taking essentially people who don't uh, think about the thermodynamics of steam in a low pressure situation are trying to make it applicable towards a uh, sterilization system. So what you actually want to do is inject steam high. So steam comes in towards the top of your container. So steam in high. And then at the back of your container, uh, opposite corner of the injection uh, port, you want, you know, uh, you want your steamlet out. So basically outlet. And the reason for doing that in particular is so that steam is always going to rise no matter what. So if you have it coming in low, it's not fucking doing anything by like coming in low. It's just it's forcing its way up and then slowly building down. Right. When you have the opposite happening, the steam is slowly going to saturate the air until it gets towards the bottom. And as the steam pushes the air towards the bottom, all that air is being pushed out naturally with gravity via the exhaust outlet on the bottom. Um, it can look a bunch of different ways, but essentially that is the best sort of mechanistic approach to getting everything to be evenly saturated with steam and replacing all the air that's in here with the process steam. So and just a linear flow pattern. So yeah, it's, it's the not, same thing it's as like not a, collecting. Right, yeah, because it will. Not, it's like the sterile air will with the lab. It'll collect in certain spots. Right. Well. And you got these weird little like wavy turbulent motions of steam if it's not set up this way. Yeah, for sure. But it looks a lot like a lab, right? So everything comes in high, X is low. It's similar in that sense. It's for two different functions, but you can think about it as it's the same it's fucking connected, thing. connected, man. Fuck, bro. Colors. Peyote buttons, bro. Um, yeah. Right on. Is that, is that pasteurization, kind of? In a nutshell? Um, yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. I guess just I I believe I just mentioned this, but um, uh, you have to knock them up quickly or they will will ferment. The reason that they will ferment, even if they don't get contaminated after the 
uh, pasteurization cycles done is there are bacterial endospores in there that will germinate if given the opportunity. It's true. So if you ever let your blocks sit for days on end before knocking them, you'll smell how sour they are. They're fermenting. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. I think a lot of people get away with that for a short period of time. Yeah. It's, it's not and, that your uh, shit's just like, gone. no, it's not, it's, done. Just, it's just not healthy. It's a bunch of, you know, nasty what happens? sugar, like, alcohol and you know, yeah. weird stuff that happens in your, in your incubation. Yeah. You'll see it immediately. It looks like your blocks got uh, inoculated too hot. Right. right. So like if they get inoculated too hot, nothing grows. It just yeah. kills the spawn on impact. It almost looks the same when you have uh, waited too long, essentially, uh, to knock something up because bacteria is already flourishing, but it's not going to show like mold. Therefore, it's going to actually just perform like it kills the spawn as everything gets sort of really like gnarly on the bottom to mid center of the bag. And then you might get a little growth on top, which yeah. is probably mold. And, uh, yeah, and often the, the, <laughs> smells like shit. the mycelium that you want that does survive, you can tell that it's like you want that nice rhizomorphic, yeah. fast, feathery, beautiful mycelium. And instead, you'll often get this really dense, um, unhappy, walled off little, yeah. little colonies of the species you are growing, struggling to survive yeah. being assaulted by much more aggressive uh, competitors <laughs> it's hard to beat most bacteria once they get going it's kind true of the idea. in any of these applications uh thermocouple data logger is important oh uh, magtech yeah if you're really gonna is that how you spell it is it yeah, magtech? yeah, it's yeah, good. yeah. Um, magtech makes these little silver bullets and they're about this size oh, they're a little bigger yeah know. it depends here yeah. Basically, they come with this little, you know, platform that hooks up to your laptop. And these are wireless, by the way, and yeah. waterproof. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not going to know right away, like, what this is, because essentially you're going to put this in the bottom of a bag. Um, it's really big. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, it's a, not that big. It's, they're maybe it's like, like the size big. of this on the pen. They're like this these little, they're, they're like, like a little bullet. <laughs> Made out of stainless steel. Yeah. They got a little gasket in the middle and all the sensors are inside the steel housing. Yeah. As long as you got that gasket tight, you can literally drop it in, uh, you water. know, liquid and it's fine. And it'll take readings of the temp of that water. Um, but these things are the most accurate and reliable data loggers we've ever come across. So we're a big fan and always suggest this company to folks. Yeah. I think they're like 500 bucks, right? Somewhere in there. Well, yeah, yeah. And there's the um the one that we bought recently for for our blocks that it's like a new one they're making that's really tiny for just for pasteurization. Yeah, and it costs like two or three hundred. Jesus, yeah. So don't buy a fucking shitty like if you go to Amazon and look for a Type K uh, thermocouple, which is kind of what you're after for this stuff, and that's just a type of thermocouple. Um, for certain situations, it's you're, a data logger is like 150 bucks, and they're important. The wires, you know, like, I think though. people don't really consider how useful these are, especially when it comes to anytime you implement a change with your equipment or with a, like a facility change. Yeah, so you want to get accurate readings of what the hell's happening now that you you say you bought a suit or you right, bought, right. bought a unicorn uh, autoclave. You want to know. Um, what's yeah, actually just, happening in reality and not relying on some shitty probe that breaks down after the 10th time you used it. Yeah, also just, those Type-K thermocouple data loggers, the little stupid plugs on the ends, and then they're, they're reading here, they actually sense temperature the entire fucking length. Mm -hmm. and it's a differential of temperature. So if for some reason it gets frayed right there and like this is the edge of your steam box and that's the block, it's going to get a lot hotter than that. So this will register at like fucking 500 and it's because it's registering this like break in the line yeah. that went through the box oh that's cool so these yeah. things are yeah it's just like it, it's the difference you know and there's a plenty of other companies that are that are worth their salt too yeah for data loggers we just highly recommend these folks these things are like wicked tough they're fucking super badass. accurate yeah. and then the coolest thing about them is besides the fact that they're wireless there's a free software that you just get from their website. And like Eric said, you Dude, get these little USB charts ports. Graphs and, and then you can see like literally exactly what happens inside your And you can uh, select process. your presets. You want it to read every 10 seconds, every hour, every 15 minutes. Yeah. It'll tell you. you yeah, know? they're awesome. So I think whether you're sterilizing or pasteurizing, that's like a super important thing to have. It's 
on par with if if you have a fruiting room and you don't have a CO2 meter, fuck off. Right. Like get a CO2 meter. Because right? again, the, the, the golden rule, no matter what, you know, what you hear, what you think, talking to other mushroom farmers online, bring books. The key is like, again, with pasteurization, one to three hours at 200 and 212. And you only get that based off of taking data from the core of a block. Yeah, you can't There's get no way around that. No. So and winter is going to be different than summer. All these things have to be tracked. Yeah. And you should track it all the time as habit. Right. Um, it's just like cleaning a fucking fruiting room or yep. whatever. Make it's sure quality control. Are good. Yeah. 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 It's all that stuff. So, yeah, pasteurization. It's time, temperature, and it's speed. If you cook stuff, you need to knock it and you need to cool it fast between that, you know, in that period. I think that sums that up. Yeah. Um, uh, one last thing. We'll get into this yeah. with like, a, I don't know, inoculation more sp- like specific episode. Yeah. But um, don't knock your blocks when they're too hot. There's a lot of misconception <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. about that. Just to quickly touch on that, you know, there's you'll hear different numbers, but the ideal is that it's at room temp. Yeah. You know, so ideally you cool it down to about that point. Yeah. So People will tell you like 90 something. It seems like it kind of depends on the species and stuff so you want to air closer to room temp if you can yeah. um but you know i've read like 86 is like the empirical number regardless you know room temp is ideal yep. so if you, if you have knock up stuff when it's really really hot you run the risk of either killing the mycelium on impact or at least denaturing it to a point where it's not going to look good yeah it might goal, survive but it won't look great yeah that's the secondary goal too of pulling these things out into a lab to cool down fast and take mm-hmm. all of that hot air is so that a no fermentation happens because things are only pasteurized but then simultaneously you want to be able to get them to a temperature fast enough that is not going to kill you know the mycelium as soon as you knock it up so yeah. it's time and temperature it's just <clears throat> speed you're trying to get as fast as possible with it the issue that I see with like Bubba barrels and with these other like electric based autoclaves is not necessarily for uh, grain spawn. Um, you don't want to cook grain in a bubble barrel, but their time takes too long and you actually end up altering the media to a degree at which it's not going to be as conducive to mycelial growth. So you just end up with a really battered sense of fucked up carbon that you're inoculating yeah <laughs> yeah it's like it's it's kin to me eating dog food for the rest of my life <laughs> versus eating a wild array of organic vegetation and grass-fed beef yeah dude sweet um, <laughs> yeah dude sweet <laughs> <laughs> um oh, how about my real, dog real shit. quick like this applies to pasteurization sterilization it's like anything there's a whole notion of like the proportion of the volume of your chamber oh yeah that's smart to not exceed when you figure out okay how many blocks can i fit in here yeah basically and there's like you know again you'll hear slightly different numbers but somewhere between like two-thirds and 80 percent um as like a maximum yeah for like your actual blocks and the racks that they're on taking up space um which is pretty easy math to do but often you see those blue micos like they stack the fuck well, see, out that's of the shit, key. It's not only is the total volume, but yeah. it's uh, airflow um, throughout yeah. the unit. So you want space for steam to be able to easily penetrate all these little nooks and crannies. So don't have all your blocks just compressed into this crazy mass or directly stacked on top of each other. Yeah. I see, you see that a lot with Bubba barrels be, just because they're cylindrical. Oh, and they're trying to maximize the fuck out of Yeah, so he's right? got this big giant brick. Can you imagine yeah. how much easier it'd be to to uh, pasteurize all those if there was a direct through way of steam to those blocks that are like right in the center of that right yeah which is why we fabricate a lot of racks basically to uh to sort of have these you know um i forget how many shells ours have something like seven but you know they're wheels they're easy to move they're just you know basically metro racks but they have stainless steel angles so you can slide metro rack shelves in between these areas. But, you know, up close with that is like you you want this metro rack that we're all used to seeing to be, uh, you know, a portion of the space between the blocks. But you need a little bit above it. You know, you yeah, don't want these. And that's really the most important aspect is like these big channels. 
Yeah, yeah. You just need air, you know, and, and this comes down to shipping, comes down to cooking, comes down to cooling. <laughs> if you actually have these things fucking stacked in there and you're you're not sort of facilitating the movement of these things into a lab uh, in an efficient way, then they're going to take forever to cool down too. And you'll be knocking blocks on the peripheral that are half cool and some are warmer in the middle. So the more air, the better. Um, also, I guess... Yeah, we're kind of jumping all over the place, but the uh, the interesting component that is a, a major issue to these things that you either fill from the top like a bubble barrel or from the sides and you uh-huh. stack in is like there's a physical person that has to move each one of these things every single fucking time. Yeah. And uh, you fill or, or unload it. And as the great Paul Stamets said, that is a vector of fucking your imagination. Of contamination. So when you're actually having to move, you know, individual blocks to individual points back and forth, you're creating like a ton of fucking like, you know, issues there. Yeah. You get away with it to a point, but at some point you're going to have some employee that's just dirty and they come in and they don't give a fuck and they're just going to start moving shit. Or you just get tired and forget. And contamination, it, you have to figure out where it's coming from and it's coming from somewhere. Yeah, you just want the most expedient, the most frictionless yeah. like transition yeah. from one space to another as possible. So ideally that's in like some sort of racks, uh, yeah. rack system or cages or people have different things like that. But um, yeah. ideally you get beyond moving them by hand because it will burn you. Even if you got the best protocol, you got like giant rubber gloves up to your shoulders and the whole nine either. yards, like at some point, there's going to be some really infectious thing that um, this you know, is even more up. important for fucking uh, um, for sterilization. But right. pasteurization, the same sort of theoretical things apply. They're not that different, you know. Right. In regards right. to the like precautions, a risk profile really is like the yeah. biggest difference. Are we at that point now to get into sterilization? sterilization? Yeah. Well, let's get there. Let's jump. I just want to get this boiler maintenance bullshit out of the way. And it's, it's an important one, but it doesn't matter if you're an electric, uh, steam generator, or if you're an actual boiler as a person, (laughs) if you are a boiler, are you a boiler? (laughs) If you're using a boiler or an electric steam generator, you want a water softener of some kind. So water treatment plan, basically it kind of, the specifics will vary on, the qualities of your water, where you live and stuff. But um, yeah, and the thing that we just decided to add on is a carbon uh, process too. So basically raw water will go in and it goes uh, through a carbon scrub, goes through a softener, and then this goes to your feed tank um, and then essentially your boiler. Um, The reason why you want to do this is scaling. Uh, Water is fucking nasty as shit. It might run clear. It might like... I see. Yeah, you won't. Yeah, you might not like get, <laughs> or, yeah, get sick true. from it or whatever. But the sediment and scale and stuff's going to build up. And yeah, these machines are complicated and they're hard to work on. And there's a lot of you know intricate little parts that are very delicate that perform vital functions. And yeah, if you get scale build up, you will. Uh, oh, your boiler's going to go down. Much. Yeah, it's going to go down fast too. And I think that's that's a consideration like we haven't taken at times uh that other farms never took and if you don't soften and treat the water to some extent which doesn't have to be chemical by any means your boiler is going to build up scale to the point at which it will fire shittily it won't produce as nice of a steam um Mm -hmm. or it'll just fail entirely based on like any of the sensors or anything that are in there right um or you'll have a total meltdown and burn your fucking facility down right like we've almost done a couple times to... <laughs> so <laughs> the fucking mosquitoes are gnarly yeah i gotta get screwed getting doors that fucking year. badass like oh, bam. yeah you just gotta like <laughs> suck it in though and eat it up so treat your water uh regardless if you even if you're going into like a, a you know just a bubba barrel or uh electric steam yeah loo, you'll thank yourself down thing. the line yeah, just fucking treat your shit, man. It's a couple thousand bucks and uh, it'll save your equipment. Um, you know, these things are supposed to run for decades, not months or a year. <laughs> so right. yeah. you got to like keep up on the, the scale component. Also, that applies for that steam getting put into a uh, expensive autoclave or something like that. 
Right. So let's go into sterilization. Right on. Sterilization. Wow, there's lots of eyes in sterilization. Yeah, dude. It's like um, a lot and a half. Whoa. Um. So sterilization. Define it for us. Yeah, is the process by which you basically kill everything using pressure, pressurized steam. Like the whole vessel is under pressure, uh, sterilized through steam, and you kill off basically any organism under the sun, except for prions. Prions. Which <laughs> we had an unnamed entity come and look at our autoclave, and they're like, what do you guys do about prions? And I was like, fuck your prions, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that, uh, I remember who that was. Yeah, anywho. Um, the similar to like the basic metric for pasteurization um, in the context of mushroom cultivation. Uh, sterilization, um, your uh, internal temps. Of 250 degrees or more. And then you're going to hear different things here about how long that needs to be. Um, the like actual scientific fact of it is based off of this calculation referred to as bio burden. Um, and so you'll hear different things, but um, in like in like very fancy laboratory settings, people typically don't actually have an internal temp at this level for much longer than five to 15 minutes. In the mushroom industry, um, there's like an air of caution that's generally applied, um, given that it's obviously would have a very high bio burden being just like a bunch of grain or a bunch of sawdust. Um, obviously there's a lot, of, a lot of life already harbored in there. So, and it's like a really dense thermo mass. It's hard to penetrate something like hardwood sawdust, like literally get into all the nooks and crannies of its cell structure. So, yeah. um, typically, what we recommend for folks is 35 minutes. We are not smoking crack over here. There really is a lot of <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Again, this is there's there's some room for debate depending on the context here, but uh. This is, this is a good standard recommendation is that your internal temps are at 250 or above for 35 minutes or more. Thing that happens with uh, sterilization that's unique and where you really get into this concept of cook the necessary amount of time, but ideally no more, is that once you get up to 250, certain chemical um, reactions start occurring in your growing medium, like uh, the most commonly referred to one is caramelization. Same thing that happens when you're sauteing your onions. Um, and that just denatures uh, the growing medium, makes it less conducive to uh, healthy mycelial growth. And so you want to basically sterilize it. So by nature, you are uh, causing chemical reactions like this occurring. They want to do it for the minimal viable time. Um, cause then you start overcooking, the more overcooking you get, just again, just like we were talking about with pasteurized growing mediums, um, just the shittier it's going to grow basically. Right. So, right. yeah, this goes back to like boiler size and autoclave size too, and trying to like get the volume and the horsepower to match up with the vessel. So say you got some fucking 80 foot autoclave, 100 foot autoclave, they're out there, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and you have an insufficient boiler to do it. Uh, there was a farm in upstate <laughs> that was doing that. Oh, uh, right. Their boiler was like the size of this fucking <laughs> very tiny, container. yeah, yeah. The size of like a, like oh, a man. fucking window AC unit. Yeah. Um, and it was like, then they had this thing that was like, giant size, like half the size of Eric's house. Yeah. Um, the address of which is uh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't come here, ever. Um, yeah, it was nuts. So like that couldn't have been efficient. No. Whatsoever. And the thing about it is like you need something that's right size, not only so that the total runtime isn't it's crazy long, but also so that like you can um, get to a, a degree where there's homogeneous temperatures the whole way through. Yeah. So in the chamber, in the blocks on the edge, in the yeah. blocks in the middle. And so with a situation like that, 
by X, like the fucking 10th hour or something here, you've gotten the blocks on the outer side up right, to 250. Right. So they're already caramelizing. Yeah. By the time you actually get to the rest of them, this shit's overcooked yeah. to such a crazy degree. And the it's other stuff like might be charcoal, maybe cooked enough. Yeah. Um, so you want stuff that's right size. So there's the right flow rate of, uh, you know, that people refer to as ramp rate where um, the rate of pressure increase right. um, and steam penetration. Um, should be high, basically. This is also why pasteurization is a lot more efficient and uh, I guess scalable from the standpoint of like a, a grower not putting in all of their hundreds of thousands of dollars into autoclaves and stuff. Right. Because pasteurization is not going to cause that level of caramelization and, and different cooking reactions. Um, it will to a degree, but it really happens a lot faster when you're fucking with pressure. Right. If you're not fucking you'll with pressure, see, you'll you don't see have to worry it. You'll see it like very easily as you kind of yeah. manipulate certain variables and test out what's best for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, 250 is interesting too. And it is this threshold of... Uh, oh, it's worth pointing yeah. out one thing here. Sorry to butt in. No, no, no. Yeah, um, yeah. You can be at... No, please. Um, <laughs> um, you can be at I have made PSI, one reference. Uh, G, as they say, PSI G. Oh, um, sure. um, PSI, basically, just to simplify it. Um, you can be at 15 PSI, but not um, necessarily be at 250. Yeah. What that means is that you didn't displace all of the air. Yeah. Inside your chamber. So you got these little air pockets that never got flushed out. And so those, you know, air has a remarkable like thermal resistance and Holy resistance shit. to, uh, you know, this process of trying to basically kill everything inside that chamber. Yeah. So you need to make sure that these things correlate if you want a good process. Yeah. And a, a visual example of that is just a pressure cooker, right? So if you've got your pressure cooker all locked down and you're, uh, you have these like two valves, right? One is your air escape valve and the other is your, uh, you know, your pressure valve. If this is closed and you're not allowing yeah. the air to purge, you're, you're going to be at 15 PSI in like 10 minutes, yeah. you know, or, or a little bit longer. But basically you didn't rid the air in here. So steam could be building up in like certain weird stratified areas and air is just building up as pressure. Yeah. Those aren't the same thing whatsoever. Right. But the register on a meter is the exact same fucking right. thing. Yeah. This is all calculated based off of the like uh, temperature that's achieved by steam under pressure, by water under yeah. pressure, not air. Not yeah. Air. That's where, whether it's a, a pressure cooker, whether it's an autoclave or a steam box is you want through air. What I see a lot of the time actually is like people will, have like a, a 1.5 inch uh, pipe inlet. And then they'll have like, they're like, oh, it just kind of weeps out the doors or whatever. And you're like, the fuck? Uh, they're not actually, they're doing the same thing in this scenario as if this started closed and didn't actually generate steam. Because how you actually use a pressure cooker is you wait for steam to be like pissing out of there and then you close it off. Then you have some like imperfect, yes, but reasonable degree of confidence that you flushed out all that all air, air and displaced it with steam and thereby more readily achieving this goal of a homogenous, you know, constant Cooked. temperature of 250. Yeah. Um, with every little, um, you know, block in every little bit of empty space in that. Yeah. Chamber. And on a 20 foot shipping container, like if you have a 1.5 inch pipe entrance, you know, of steam, basically, or, you know, of process steam, you want two inches of, uh, of airline always out. Um, and that's through the whole fucking process of your boiler ebb and flowing of steam, like trickling and then forcing its way out until you'll notice, like, as your boiler cycles, your steam generator cycles, the same amount of steam is coming out of there. And that means the saturation, the saturation of steam is like fully maxed out. You right. know? You're not, there's no more air in there for the most part. And this is where this common misconception of like vacuum sealing bags and shit comes from. Right. You can tell you've had a pretty successful cook in a lot of these scenarios if your bags are sort of like sucked in um, for gravity cycles and pasteurization cycles. And that's because it's pulled all the air out and replaced it with steam. And, uh, and that is a very efficient way to sort of read, you know, what's going on. Um, it's not an exact science way for sure, but you know, important visual cue. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a cue. Something seems off. Something's off. Um, 
but the displacement of air with steam <laughs> is like the goal of sterilization. For right. Sure. And there's all kinds of interesting ways that that's been modernized. Um, but you know, there's like the old school approach of, uh, what you call gravity, gravity cycle, yeah. as Eric just referred to. So here's your, um, uh, you know, zero PSI baseline. Um, and the goal is, you know, you got your stuff here to begin with and you just start pumping in steam. Um, once you get to that point where, um, uh, you flushed out air, you start to ramp it up to a plateau. Um, and then once you're at that point where everything is indeed at the homogenous 250 or whatever the set point is, then you hold it there for a predetermined amount of time. Again, AKA somewhere in this range. Um, and then cut your steam and they'll passively start to cool down. Um, gravity cycles are really straightforward. They don't require, um, they're, yeah, they're not that complicated, um, in terms of infrastructure. What most, uh, most industries do is some variety of what's called a vacuum cycle. Um, the basic concept here is that you utilize, uh, both a, uh, you know, your, your boiler and a vacuum pump to sort of force the process of flushing out all that air. And you basically just have these moments where it goes up in pressure, down in pressure, up in pressure. And then the same thing like gravity, gravity cycle, you're able to bring it up to, to temp and hold it there and shoot your way back down to baseline zero PSI. The reason why this is done is it drastically speeds up the process. Long yeah. story short. Um, the interesting part about like that exact shape though, is it's, it's more akin to like this. So every time yeah. it yeah. draws it up, it's like drawing it up a little bit further until this thing is at the plateau where it, you know, it sort of functions. Yeah. Well, the, the way it often functions too is like, in order to get to that point where you reach homogeneity, yeah. those vacuum pulses down have to get really intense as you, as you try to climb higher yeah. with your pressure. So it's kind of like air's right is this upward momentum. But like yeah, these get still like pitched down. Yeah, they yeah, pitch yeah, down. Yeah. And by the time you're doing your last pulse, it's pulling a really deep vacuum. And so this is trying to get rid of every fucking little every piece little of bit. Air. And then again, the upshot of this is. In this process, that whole initial point where you're trying to flush out air, get temperature uh, homogeneity, can be radically faster than just shooting in steam. Um, that can take hours and hours and hours longer. And again, that's your time, that's propane or natural gas that you're spending. And the products. And then the uh, health of your, uh, your the health of your grow, basically. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that we have such a, uh, a carefully calculated process is because we want our products to jump off to that degree for everybody in the process, you know. Um, there's also a liquid cycle, which is interesting and probably an important distinction if people are making their own shit. Yeah. But it's essentially a gravity cycle. Which is very gentle. Yeah. So like here's a, a traditional gravity cycle or something like that, you know, a liquid cycle is like uh, it basically, you know, it gets up to temp like that, holds it and then like really gently pulls it down. Right. And you really just don't want to boil over. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's it. You don't want to break all your Pyrex or whatever the case might be. You don't want to boil over. So on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge, uh, huge sort of issue to compare and contrast. And this is all things. like, again, this is just a great example of something um, similar to like the basics of pasteurization and a lot of the concepts that come up in mushroom farming, we can get stuck in our own little silo about this yeah. and only be talking to each other. And then it right. just takes a little bit of research to be like, holy fuck, like people right. that do way more heady stuff than what we do, <laughs> as cool as it is, yeah. they do this stuff too. Like it's, yeah. it's known, it's online, yeah. you know, just like all those different cycle options. That's like standard operating procedure for yeah. the sciences as a whole and for all yeah. kinds of interesting industries. They're just trying to figure out the right time and temperature for the right products and processes. And I think that that becomes like the distinguishing factors. Like if, yeah. you, if you're just trying to cook, you know, rat cages, it's yeah, just like exactly. some piece of equipment. It's, like, bam, yeah, yeah. it's done. Yeah. It's about um, speed at that point. Right. I really don't give a shit about caramelization. Or anything. Right. Yeah. So our heady notions come in when we're trying to preserve the integrity of a piece of hydrated kernel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. Like, or a, uh, a piece of oak. 
Yeah. Um, so right. we're assuming with this 35, even though that's above what people typically say is the highest bio burden sterilization need, bio is we got some bird. obscene fucking bio burden because we're packing in thousands of pounds of hydrated bird. organic matter in really tight bags. Right. So we assume that the bio burden is uh, unprecedented as far as uh, you know Duke University is concerned. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it is interesting it is an issue that i don't think a lot of people cook like these sensitive products that are going through different biological living organisms and stuff mm -hmm. it's a little strange i mean i don't know I mean, i'm no pharmaceutical sterilization agent of chaos but right. it's just a it's an interesting process that we try to use and utilize um it's expensive though so, like, let's talk about the barrier for entry for these two things because it is right. interesting, right? Yeah, it's big. If you um, find an autoclave that can just be injected with a boiler, you've got whatever the cost of the autoclave is, 10 to 20K, then your boiler to run that. <coughs> it's, it's This is complicated. This is be ideal, up. right? But let's give the example of somebody who's uh, trying to operate with a low pressure boiler. So like a Sioux, right. they put, you know, 30 K into their big boiler. That's not high pressure and it will only ever get this autoclave up to, you know, maybe five to 10 PSI. Is it better than nothing? Sure. Right. Especially for something like substrate. Would yeah. I cook grain spawn through it? Probably not. Yeah. It's just a gradient. Like I think we talked about this before with a uh, shiitake, I think a yeah. shiitake episode, yeah. but like, there's, yeah, there's clear differentiation between pasteurization, sterilization, there's all kinds of other more esoteric like heat processes. Like look yeah. up what the milk industry does and you'll see like weird, oh, uh, yeah. weird terms like short time, <laughs> high temp cycle. Um, yeah, yeah, weird yeah, terms yeah. like that. But it's, yeah, it's a gradient ultimately. And like, you yeah. know, that five to 10, you're uh, in a unique kind of middle ground where you are killing off Oh, certain yeah. things that you wouldn't be at a true pasteurization, but you're not genuinely at sterilization where you're like quite confident you're killing every bacterial endospore yeah. um, under the sun. No, for sure not. You know? And uh, I think you get away with certain things and not others. And this becomes a very like mystical approach to not having hard science behind it at all. Right. Uh, a vacuum style autoclave is like uh, 100 to 300 K. Or more. Yeah, it depends on the size and it's very, very expensive is the idea. And then a high pressure boiler to run it, about 150 to 200 K. And uh, so these are the, <laughs> I don't even want to add that up. You know how much money we've almost spent. So you're calling it half a mil, man. Um, to be able to like get to, to this point, it's not necessary that you take these other steps. You could just buy a really nice high pressure boiler and run a gravity cycle on an autoclave, you know, that can't do vacuum. Yeah. Um, it should be clarified that you can't just attach a vacuum to a normal autoclave. There are certain ways to do that, um, but they're not as efficient as, you know, an actual well, mechanistic so computer. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't do this shit manually. It's not a, it's not like an old school retort if you're trying to go in that direction, which no, is it's really not cool. conducive. There's like one or two people that do it. I know that for a fact manual vacuum yeah. poles that's yeah. scary yeah it's not i don't know yeah that's a whole other yeah, dynamic kind of, of chaos yeah. um, there's like an important uh middle ground though that i don't know if we've covered everything for sterilization but we talked about it in that shiitake episode maybe we should go into it a little bit more um just that like middle ground of quasi sterilization with that 10 ish psi situation no, just uh, how you cook stuff, right? So if you have a retort that can get up to, um, say, 15 PSI, mm -hmm. and so the maximum this can get to is 15 PSI. Right. An important distinction, if you have a boiler that is apt in size to feed this and get it up to that, is to use your thermocouple as the marker. So this thing will get up to like 40 PSI, right? I think for our clave, you need like 45 to the head right. of the yeah. uh, vessel. Yeah. So yeah. the the boundary here, and this is like the more complicated notion is like clean, dirty, just to distinguish these two zones. So you load things in dirty, you exit them into a clean room. There is no middle ground in this scenario. Right. Yeah. This is HEPA filtered all the way over on this side. 
you basically get your internals of the, the vessel up to 15 PSI, and then you wait until your thermocouple uh, on the inside of a bag gets to 200, you know, to 212. So only pasteurization temps, and it's got pressure surrounding it. And that way you're basically cutting off the boiler at the time that this gets to that, which allows you to not overcook substrate, which can become detrimental if you're using raw inputs, for instance. Um, but it allows the vessel to maintain sterility. So as the vessel drops in pressure, and then you can pull these, you know, pasteurized or ultra pasteurized blocks out into a clean room, you end up with far less contamination and some other weird advantages occur like shiitake yields, mm -hmm. grounding, buckling. There's a lot of like interesting avenues there, but I don't know yeah. what to call this other than utilizing really expensive equipment to try to not overcook something. Right. Which goes right back to what I was saying about like uh, pasteurization being this very efficient scalability yeah. you know, option or yeah. ultra pasteurization. Yeah. It's worth mentioning too here that like um, another 30,000 foot consideration yeah with uh you know your your blocks or um logs or whatever it is uh um with your substrate uh you have like a lot of optionality totally we do know of examples of people who would like pasteurize their their spawn yeah not recommended it's a bad idea yeah um you need to go full bore and sterilize even if that's in a tiny vessel at a tiny scale as the case might be you know oh, yeah um it should be genuinely sterilized because you're at the, the top of that pyramid and i'm checking your mic hey come dude you're good sorry here oh charlie <laughs> oh no <laughs> sorry all right top of the pyramid uh yeah pyramid. so you don't want to take those risks uh you know not genuinely having a, a truly sterile growing medium at the beginning of the cultivation cycle yeah from which you just expand the quality of your work so if it's right. compromised with a little bit of bacteria or whatever that survived to then by the time you get to fully expanded substrate lots um you might be in deep so yeah sterilize your spawn that's the model of the story there yeah and you can get away with this quasi pasteurization sterilization methodology for substrate um yeah totally with uh sterile um hmm. if you sterilize uh kind of in contrast to what we were talking about with um the flexibility with pasteurization where you can kind of like move it from your uh your chamber your shipping container whatever it is you know through kind of a middle ground space into your hepa filtered cool down space yeah sterilization as this uh illustration indicates um you need to be um uh moving direct from uh the chamber you know directly into a um completely yeah. sterile hepa positive filtered space the the basic idea there is that um you know once you've sterilized something you've killed everything that's inside of it so you have this this great sterile medium you can be convinced is going to be genuinely axenic word of the day um damn meaning only only one species growing in it, aka the oysters or whatever that you want to grow. But it's like an open buffet for any um, contaminants lurking about. Um, yeah. It's much more readily contaminated than a pasteurized growing medium. Um, so by moving it, you know, through the second door of an autoclave directly into a clean, clean room environment, you're ensuring that, um, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, and then. In general, there, there's just a higher degree of risk. So generally a higher degree of steps taken to ensure that you don't contaminate sterilized growing medium. So that primarily extends to just, uh, until they're hermetically sealed, um, in the knock process. Yeah. Uh, having them in as clean an environment as possible. It might even go so far as to have things like what we do in our, uh, spawn lab, which is, um, everyone wearing full body PPE and like the whole nine yards of like the, you know, cleanest Martian environment you might want. Um, so there's some room for interpretation depending on the type of risk you want to um, take on as a farm. But the moral of the story is, is if you are actually sterilizing, you just need to be very, very clean in your process. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you need to concern yourself with a lot more other variables, for instance. Um, 
I'm going to draw out like two things that I think this kind of, uh, I'll do one for, uh, for Shane because apparently he watches these things, which is cool. Nobody will know who Shane is, but Shane, so, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> this is just like a, a quick example of the idea of a, a plenum, two equally sized rooms and, um, the way in which air can sort of flow, um, and this, this, thanks, you almost got it. Oh man. So I know this is going to be a little complicated and convoluted, but it's important consideration and probably gives away too much information, but fuck it. We'll just do it. Um, the plenum for temperature to keep a lab at an integral sort of safety standpoint with these positive pressurized fans is to equally pressurize two identically sized rooms or equally pressurize different sized rooms. It doesn't matter so long as the same airflow is going through there. When you create a sterile laboratory environment, every room has to have an input of plenum air, essentially. Um, the, the alternative is that when you're trying to cool down substrate, Something that you can do if these things are coming out of a clave at like a hundred to I say hundred to two hundred and fifty, depending yeah. on like Yeah, it depends on the clave, I guess. Yeah. Right? So for sure. All right. Well they would they'd only be coming out of two twelve, right? Because you're not gonna pull anything out pressurized. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Open the door. <laughs> Open the door now. <laughs> you get it. Boom. <laughs> yeah, oh fuck. That's so that's to me. Yeah, these are like two, yeah, it's two hundred degree air. If you have people working in a flow hood, like, you know, in here, both these rooms are positive pressurized by these fans, right? One can pull from like the plenum or from a different area and exhaust outside. Um, it doesn't have to go back into the stream uh, to mm -hmm. recirculate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you generally don't want it. Yeah. No, but the room right next to it can be fucking 60 degrees, ideally. And it can come through your little uh, doggy doors back into your main corridor and back to the plenum so that you can, you know, evenly, you know, yeah. uh, pressurize that. But you don't at the same time have to worry about cooling uh, or having this hot air get through your system. You can just kind of create this separate area. Yeah. Right? I mean, the main reasons for that are really fucking simple. It's just, um, number one, you don't want to be sweating your ass off um, as you're doing your work in the rest of the clean room facility. Um, because if you have the air going this way, it's just, you know, wicked hot. Yeah. Ster sterile, yeah, but really hot air coming coming at you. Oh, um, totally, man. And then also it'll just smell bad. Um, if you just have like a bunch of blocks oh, or a bunch God. of grain spawn bags, just, you know, the, <laughs> you know, off gassing and whatnot, just hitting at all times, it's, that's also just not nice. No, it's not. Um, and then you sure. want those rooms at the same level, basically, because you're going to be moving between the two of them frequently as you pull racks from the clave move racks to do a knock session, you'll be moving back and forth, back and forth all the time. So if they're at the same level, then you can kind of ensure that you're not um, sending air from the cool down room through the facility, as we talked about, but also that you're maximizing the amount of air from the rest of the facility uh, getting recirculated if you want to recirculate it through a plenum. Yep. As That's opposed true. to getting pulled through the cool down and having the wrong airflow situation. Um, pasteurization, it, it sort of goes a little bit differently, but you can still use a cooling capacity to your favor. So let's say you have your steam box or, or you have your whatever unicorn loo thing out here and your entrance. So this is going to be your, your, you know, sort of quasi clean area. This is your, uh, vessel <laughs> and this is your lab. Basically, if you take an AC, uh, depending upon the size that you need for recirculation, the input of the AC comes into this kind of walled off area. This is a room separate from the lab, but the static pressure and the fan speed is matched. So if this is coming in at 3000 CFMs and you have to have enough HEPA filtration fans that carry that 3000 CFMs into the actual laboratory and then have the return come back to the AC. Um, so essentially it's like a pre cooling room or a pre cooling plenum. It's, uh, technically like a pre filter room instead of a pre, uh, 
preconditioning room, if you will. Yeah. So the goal in this is just you can get your stuff to cool down a lot faster. Same principle applies, you know, for a, for a sterilization area as well. So you just need to match the fan speed and, and have an AC with a return coming from the lab and only input into this like pre-filter room where all your flow heads will carry it forward. So the same sort of concepts can apply to these things. Um, I guess this is no longer how to generate steam, but I still like it. Yeah. So those are, I don't know, that's, I mean, we kind of went a little further there, but uh, yeah, those are the major differences. Yeah, there's pros and cons to, yeah. you know, the two ends of the spectrum. Neither of them is necessarily right if you're talking about blocks. Um, no, man, I think, uh, I think when it comes down to it, you really do have to like, you have to consider your, your, your financial entry too. We're not talking shit on Bubba barrels either, by no means. No, like if that's your way to, to do it, do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And just be, just be cognizant of the equipment you're using and the limitations that it imposes upon you. Cause any of them have limitations. Yeah, they do. Whether those limitations are, it's really goddamn hard to get your blocks uh, thoroughly pasteurized in a bubble barrel right. to, oh, you're operating a vacuum autoclave and um, don't blow up the neighborhood, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's true. It just depends <laughs> on where you're at and, and what you want to focus on. Yeah, that's very true. But the important, I think one of the most important things that we talked about here is there are empirical standards about what is pasteurization and what is sterilization. Yeah. Follow those, not, you know, um, Michael John seven seven two on some uh, Dude, I chat to, forum. I tend to trust that guy <laughs> <laughs> about you know what he thinks is legit. You know, yeah, that's funny. Is like I I remember that. that. It totally does, man. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of these concepts like are not as easy to understand initially, and you really need to like go through the motions. So hopefully, some of this is rather helpful to somebody. But I think that when it comes down to it, the general principle for all of this is like how the third world works in terms of vulture pasteurization which is just a fuck ton of steam to get blocks to a certain point mm -hmm. it's inefficient but it's also pretty efficient yeah. you know compared to electric uh you know boiling so i think that's kind of where a lot of people over the years have built those like rr systems with like two barrels you know having a boiler barrel and having a pasteurization chamber, um, which is pretty cool. Did you ever see one of those? I built one like out in, uh, out in Arizona. Not sure. It's, you know, basically you have 55 gallon drums, right? So you'd have a 55 gallon drum, either this is like, I, usually it's just flame. You get those like uh, oh yeah propane okay, burners, right? That. Yeah, so you can have like X amount of water in here if you figure out what you're going into. Yeah. And then it steams into a barrel up top, which is on its side. And like he was fancy as fuck. So we copied his ass and he did two shelves. So you'd have like blocks up here if this is open, right? And then you'd have blocks down here and they'd feed the whole way in. And uh, essentially you just have, have it like this. So you just have a single rack holding these things and you essentially have made a boiler and you're injecting it into a, a 55 gallon drum up top and you're exhausting it and same principles apply. So you can build something like that too. I know a fair amount of people operate like that, but you have an open flame. Um, if you try to put an electric uh, water heater in here, it would just take a lot longer. So considerations can be made for like getting back woodsy about it and really fucking going whole ham with a propane burner. Mm -hmm. um, is it legal and safe? I don't know, probably not. Fuck it. Right on. So thank you, Roger Rabbit. I think that covers it. Damn, I think that's it. Yeah. How to generate steam. I feel like it's just <laughs> going to be a, like a disclaimer because you can always go on and on about these topics. Oh it's like, we'll God. talk about this again. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No doubt. It's really hard to, to, to navigate the ins and outs of all these things. But, um, well, I'm Eric Lohman. Yes, I'm Tyler Crawford. And thank you for listening. So to Michael Wizard's Deep Dives episode, Fuck My Life. <laughs>